Welcome to another episode of Biz in the 916. I'm Kristen Berkery, and I've been a marketing, advertising, and technology professional for 25 years. We're recording here in the 916. That's Sacramento, California, for those of you listening elsewhere. You may not realize it, but the technology industry has become big here in Sacramento. We're close to the Bay Area, but we have a lower cost of living and doing business. So most of the big Silicon Valley tech companies have satellite locations here in the Sacramento area. You'll find Intel, Apple, HP, and Oracle, among others. And there are tech incubators and innovation plans actively being developed by local government and educational institutions, making startups a hot topic. I've known my guest today for a long time. Rob Haney and I worked together almost 20 years ago at a dot-com in the automotive industry. But more recently, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with him again on his technology startup, Sensor Transport which designs tracking sensors and software for the shipping industry. Rob is one of the most forward-thinking entrepreneurs I know, and I wanted the chance to ask him what it's like to create a tech startup. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. Hi, Kristen. So great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Tell us more about what Sensor Transport does. Yeah, Sensor Transport is actually a network. We're connecting the world's biggest shippers with truck drivers who are typically owner operators working in a local market. So it's, a, it's an interesting network because currently a guy that's driving a truck for a living and, and delivering stuff across international uh, moves is contracted through a kind of this highly fragmented network of brokers and the person who actually owns the freight has no idea who that driver is. So the driver is, is anonymous and they're really disenfranchised from the value they create. All they ever hear is, hey, I need a lower price, lower the price, you know, whatever. And as a result, the industry is, is kind of a mess. So, so a driver will, if a driver is, is, is a bad actor and he's stealing or he's late all the time or he just does a bad job, there's no way to know that. And, then, and there's also no way to, to reward your, your best drivers. And so it's just, it's just, it's a worldwide problem. It's a big problem. I've been, I've been suffering with it my entire professional career since actually after we met at, a, at first startup, I got more into international supply chain. So ever since we first met, I've been suffering with this problem. And so my team and I have set out to solve it and then we're solving it by, by lighting up those networks. So we're, you have a big shipper, someone who's moving stuff internationally or, or, or we're talking big box like truckloads. If they're, um, if they want to connect to their drivers directly, then they, they call Sensor Transport and we hook them up. What industries benefit from using Sensor Transport's technology? So it's, it's about digitized deliveries, right? So if you think about the Amazon effect, right? A, de- a delivery is no longer acceptable the way it used to be when, when, when I grew up. It used to be, you know, you'd, you would order something and you had to pay a lot for the shipping and then you'd wait for a week for it to arrive in the mail and sometimes it didn't and, and you know, sometimes it would get lost. And you had to go. It was a mess. So, so nowadays, and really Amazon led the way, everybody has a different expectation for, for shipping. Uh, and this is kind of parcel world, right? But you, you expect it to be pretty seamless, pretty free, you kind of arrive the next day. But the, and those expectations impact people who work in international as well and we're like why can't we have that why can't we have that tracking capability why can't we have that that level of service and so people uh that we're talking to are we like to say they have urgency because that idea of a digitized uh, delivery uh is something that their customers are demanding so big logistics companies and and big global shippers who are you know mired in literally pen and paper based deliveries like it's 1975 are eager to adopt a system that allows them to digitize that delivery. And that's what we bring them. So you asked me what industries are are we working with? Primarily it's the, um, the logistics industry, which is, they're not, it's not a household. They're not household names, but there are big players. You may have heard of them. Like Kunin Nagel is a big, is a big player. They're not our customer. Uh, Some of, some of our customers are, are big global shippers though. And we're signing up more all the time. Now, you mentioned that you've had to deal with shipping challenges. Uh, how did you come up with the idea of sensor transport? Yeah, so I think I should explain the sensor part of sensor transport. So we, we talked about how it's a digitized delivery. And then the, sen- the reason it's called sensor transport is because of one really cool feature, which is if you add an IoT, which is the Internet of Things, have you heard of that one? So an IoT sensor is a, like a low-cost sensor that you can you can you can put it 
you know, on a thing, and, and, and sometimes they're actually built into the thing, right? And then you, that sensor is doing stuff. It's sensing the environment around it. So, so if you're a, a shipper of something that's perishable, something that, that, that's vulnerable to temperature, um, like heat or cold, like uh, so pharmaceutical fits in this category, food and beverage, of course, chemicals. So anybody that's shipping that stuff, they're really worried about their product being damaged during transit. And it, it happens quite a lot, especially right now. I think it's like 104 degrees outside today, right? So mm -hmm. this is the perfect weather for center transport. We go call our, 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 the, the customers that are, are worried about their um, getting, getting damaged during transport. And they're really worried during the summer. So, but the problem is the, the device that they, that they put on product today is very expensive and it's very disconnected. So, so that same delivery that I talked about, that digitized delivery can read the sensor with a high degree of automation and get the data from the journey. And it'll say, this one did not get damaged or this one may have been damaged. It may have got too hot sitting on the, tarmac at the Sacramento airport, you better inspect it to make sure it's okay. So the long preamble, Kristen, to answer your question, the reason I came, that where I came up with the idea for Sensor Transport was a previous startup uh, that I did called OpenPort. It was actually based in Hong Kong. And the idea there was to use a, a, a to connect to the driver, same idea with an app that they download, but to build a, an optimization system so they would do their routing better, right? And so we signed up a few, because it was very early uh, in, in logistics uh, startup land. And we signed up a few truckers and we, had, we caught some attention. One of, the, one of our big clients was Unilever. And at one point they pulled me in the room and they said, you know, what you're doing is super interesting to us. We can see all this great data coming through, but it, it has low value compared to what's happening in the back of the truck. We're much more worried that our ice cream is melting. And it was a real light bulb moment for me because I realized in that moment that I could add an IoT sensor. I already had technology in the delivery moment, right? I already had an app catching a digitized signature and doing other things. But by adding a, simple, a very low cost IoT sensor, I solved a much bigger problem. And that's when the idea for sensor transport was born. The sensors you're talking about, so they go in the back of the truck with uh, the commerce that's being shipped. That's right. Um, are they, is there one sensor per shipment or are they in each individual container within that, that truck? Yeah. Uh, all, all models are, are, are available. So sometimes, generally, we recommend one sensor per pallet, you know, the pallet being the, the wooden thing that the, the boxes sit on and you wrap it. So we, we recommend one sensor per pallet. And um, the reason we like that is because in international shipping, it's very common for the loads to get consolidated and deconsolidated. So if you think about that, right, so you're, you're, you're buying stuff from China, for example. So you might be buying stuff from two or three different factories and it comes into a, a certain play, like a warehouse where you put it all together in one shipment. And so each of those pallets in that shipment uh, is, could have a sensor. And then when it arrives in the United States, they deconsolidate it. They take it, they open the container, they take it, and then it's, it's loaded on three or four different trucks going in different directions. So by putting the sensor at the pallet level, we're able to measure the entire journey, if that makes sense. How big is a sensor? Oh, they're tiny. They'll fit in the palm of your hand. And in fact, we're, they're getting smaller all the time. And uh, they're, they're, you know, they, they call it the IoT revolution. We don't build sensors. Uh, we have an engineer on our staff who, who kind of looks around and certifies them and keeps us in the, in the loop on the IoT revolution. But it's really just in its infancy really just starting out. And I think it's going to be amazing. You're going to see this affect all different aspects of your life from, from smarter refrigerators where, where there's sensors on the refrigerator telling you you're out of milk to smarter homes, smarter cars. And then, and then the space I'm interested in is smarter logistics. Now the sensors communicate with a mobile app. Is that correct? Yeah. So our sensors require a reader. And, and that's a bit of a, a departure from what a lot of people in my space are doing. There are plenty of other sensor companies out there that are putting sensors together that have a SIM card, like a cell phone built into them, and then they send the data through a telephone network directly. But the problem is in international shipping, that's very expensive because now you have to think about, okay, now I've just sent a sensor that's worth $200 or more across the world. So now I have to recharge the battery. I have to get it back to China. So by, by working with IoT sensors, which do not have SIM cards and cannot communicate outbound on their own, uh, I can get the price radically low. And if you're shipping thousands of pallets a month, the idea of putting a $200 sensor on each one is, is a non-starter, especially if it's a commodity product. So we'll talk to you know, food producers who are shipping corn. The cost of logistics exceeds the value of the goods 
This is true of chemicals and a lot of different products. So IoT really, really helps at the bottom of the of that pyramid, where the where it's more commodity, and that and those are my those are my customers. And yes, so to answer your question, the sensor is logging the, the heat or the temperature, the humidity, or the shock motion all along the journey, and then you read it at destination. Now a reader can be a, can be a cell phone app that you've downloaded on your phone, downloaded by the driver or the person receiving the shipment, who we call the consignee, or it could. We've just recently deployed. A Raspberry Pi, so not to get a little technical, it's a little mini computer, which you, which you install at the dock door, and that will read the sensor with automation, so you don't have to have a person. So if you, if you would prefer just to read it uh, that way, then we, we do have a device that serves as the reader. You do need to read the data out at, at destination. What is the challenge you've had to overcome to make sensor transport a success? So it's a startup, right? So it's... Um, I would say that the biggest challenge that I faced in, in, in my startup journey, if I was to put it all together, um, is, is the difference between my first startup, Openport and Sensor Transport. And that, that's a problem of culture. So it, it sounds funny to say that because you, when you do a startup, you're worried about money and you're worried about the product and getting the product out the door and everything. But what happened to me, and I think is a good watch out for anybody who's interested in doing a startup, is you end up putting so much of yourself into a business, three years of your life, your personal fortune is at, at risk. And in the end, you hate the company you work for. It's, it's really tragic, right? So, so when I left Openport, it was, the, it, was, it was the happiest day of my life. I was so glad to get out of that company because I hated it. And, and, and that, I have nobody to blame but myself. I founded it, right? So the reason that happened was because I let my co-founder really own the company culture. And he just turned into a megalomaniac and decided he was going to establish a culture of fear. And he thought that was a cool idea. It was an awful idea. So, so at, at the first thing I did at Center Transport is I established four pillars of, um, of culture, which we adhere to. And when you, when you come to Center Transport as a team member, uh, you, are, you are taught the four pillars of culture and, and, and we live by them. I love that idea because, you know, how, how you treat people really matters in the workplace. It does. And it's, it, it's true across the board. So not just people, but the way we think about our customers, the way we think about our investors. I mean, one thing that happens in a bad culture with startups is you'll start lying to your investors. And once you go down that road, you, there's, you, you've, you're in the dark. You, you'll never come back. Um, it's, if you ever see Silicon Valley and HBO, it's funny because they, they hire a a group to start lying to their investors to buy pumping up their, and, and I'm not going to mention any names, but I have met founders of startups who are doing just that. They're, they're using pizza delivery, running at a loss to pump their numbers up. It's outrageous, but that's what happens when you, when you start down this road of, of lying to your investors, lying to yourself, really. You have to be willing to, to look at the metrics and accept them. So that's a big part of our, of our culture. We, uh, we, we talk about transparency and, and you know, we have to be true to ourselves and we have to be true to our investors. So it, let, let the data flow, man. Let, let the truth be out. That's better. <laughs> that's, that's one of our pillars. Hey, are you enjoying this interview on Biz in the 916? Support us on Patreon and help us develop more great interviews. Patreon supporters will get exclusive business content you can use today to help your career or business. Check us out at patreon.com slash biz in the 916. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash biz in the 916. And you'll help us continue to share business stories and insight. What's it like to pitch to investors in the tech space? So, so interesting. I, I, I think it's a, it's a bucket list item for me anyway. And I, I just did it last week um, in New Jersey. There was a, we accelerated a, at a great accelerator called Newark Venture Partners. They're very cool. They did a great job for us. And uh, it culminated in what they called their demo day. So I was at the, uh, what's called the Audible Cathedral, a really cool building in Newark, New Jersey. And I was able to pitch it, uh, my, uh, in fact, Kristen, if you'd like, you can, you can see it on YouTube. And uh, it was awesome. So you're in front of you know, an audience of 300 people and you're on stage with a microphone. It's really exciting. And then you were able to go out. But it's very, it's very hard. You have, to, um, you have to be ready. So you, you, you generally are doing 12 slides. Uh, and uh, that you follow a pretty kind of a standard flow and every, everybody who's pitching kind of is going to follow that standard flow and you got to be on message and you got to be, uh, you got to be tight and you, you know, you know, you want to be able to really get your point across quickly in a way that an investor can, can see it and understand it. Because, you know, what's interesting yet, if you put on the, think about the other side of the, of that, of that audience, right? Those people in that audience, 
they're pressurized to invest. Just as you're pressurized to try to get money, they need to find, if you're a venture, if you work for a venture capital company and you spend a year and you say, you know what, there's nobody good out there. They're all, they all suck. We're not gonna put, we're not gonna bet. That's not good. Yeah, they, they expect you to find somebody to invest in. So the, the analysts and the, and the VCs are looking for that jewel, that special company that they can invest in. And, they're look, and each one of them has their own secret formula. Maybe it's the team. Maybe it's, it's, it's something to do with the way the product works or it's a patent or it's an industry. But they have their own secret formula and, they, and they're looking for that match. And you don't know what it is, but you better be on your game because you, it could leak at every scene. They're going to look at your technology, their, your team. Your, uh, your forecast, your confidence, all that stuff comes together in the pitch. So it's quite an intense moment. If you Google Airbnb's pitch, that is the standard, right? So if you want to see what a great pitch looked like, Airbnb did a great pitch. And they, they were very nice about putting their 12-point deck online. So you just Google it, check it out. What are your goals for sensor transport over the next few years? Our, our short-term goal is to... It, we're, very pleased that I was able to raise a bridge round. So, so we have, we're including a little bit of cash from our backyard where we live in the city of Elk Grove. So thank you, city of Elk Grove. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, but that, that bridge round is, is just about wrapping up now. I'm expecting maybe one more investor to come in and then I'll wrap it. And that gives us enough uh, runway, rocket fuel, right, cash, to survive until uh, about uh, 12 months, middle of next year at which time I'll go for what they call the, the priced round. They used to call it Series A. And, um, and that means that a VC, a more serious venture capital, kind of the next level of venture capital, would, um, would do a larger investment and, and take a larger bite of the company in terms of equity. And so uh, that's my near-term goal is to, is to, is to finalize, uh, really focus on building the business and getting to that priced round, at which time, uh, we will have achieved uh, the next major milestone, which would be, uh, you know, I have, it, it, everyone on the team gets a book. Uh, I, I get everybody a book. It's part of my get back to culture. I want everybody to be on the same page. And the name of the book uh, is, a, is a great book by Burkowski called How to Build a Billion Dollar App. And so um, we're, still in, we're still stuck in chapter one, or, or ch stuck in chapter two, which is how to build a $10 million app. We've, we crossed the million dollar mark a while ago, but we're stuck in chapter two trying to get to that $10 million app. And when we go through that price round, we'll be at the $10 million app. And then the next two years after that will be the journey to building a $100 million app, which according to the book is the hardest part actually, because, uh, uh, and I'm expecting that. So you, you, you kind of go into, you kind of go into the whirlwind, right? So everything is built to scale and certainly my business can scale. Um, the way my business scales is, is because it's a network, right? The big shippers are talking to the little carriers. And then if the little carrier is happy, happy, then he introduces us to other shippers and so on and so on. Um, so, so that is my goal for the next year. I, I, uh, everyone on my team, I don't know if you remember that old, that old, uh, poster, the hang in there cat with hanging from the rope. Mm -hmm. So I, I we, we, it, it all, hurts. we all have that hanging in our office that hang in there. Cause that's the zone we're in now. We just got to hang in there till we can get through to that price round. And then it all changes. Uh, and those posters will come down and there'll be a poster of a gorilla or something. Cause it'll be like time to grow fast, get big fast is, our, is the theme. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs who want to get a startup off the ground? Yeah, I would say make sure that, that it, it's a startup because not everything's a startup, right? So, so a startup means that you're raising investment capital for a reason, okay? So if I think about my business, the reason I'm raising startup money is because there's nothing so secret about what I'm doing, right? I'm, I, it's not. It's not like it's not like there's a. It's not like I invented uh, some 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 new technology that's proprietary. It's not like a time machine. Right? So in order for me to, to control to really get value out of what we're doing, it's important that we build the network quickly before competitors realize that 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 what I'm doing is successful and begin to imitate us. And so that, that it's that growth factor, and also um, the scale up is global in nature. So all of our customers are global in nature. And so I need to be ready to scale globally. Um, we're already active in North America, Europe, and Mexico. And we just signed an agreement for Thailand. So uh, so that it's these factors that you have to think through. Like so, so you know, if the business was such a nature that I could build it organically by getting a couple marquee accounts to sign up and then building on that from a nice and then just build it over time. That might be a better way to go because first of all, you don't have to give up. You're not giving up any equity. 
There's you're gonna have less stress in your life, right? So you have to think that through. There's nothing wrong with a what I would call a lifestyle business versus a a, a true startup, which which needs that investment capital in order to ch- to achieve that exponential growth. What are the steps involved in getting a startup off the ground? The first thing you have to do is you is you have to you have to build out that pitch deck, and then uh, and then you have to kind of get a spreadsheet together to 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 do your, your, your financials and figure out a business plan. So I would suggest you write the business plan, get the spreadsheet out, prove to yourself, at least in a, in a way that, that you think makes sense, that it's a, that it's a viable business. And, and you're going to have to do like a five-year model based on a lot. It's, it'll feel like a, a house of cards because you're basing your assumptions on top of assumptions, right? But when you've gotten that far, then you're ready to try to make a pitch. Now, my first pitch was done for plug and play. Plug and play based in Silicon Valley or down in Sunnyville, but they're everywhere, uh, is, a nice, is a nice what they would call an incubator. So they take, they'll take somebody that has got nothing, nothing more than a PowerPoint and, and give you an opportunity to present your idea to industry. And uh, I pitched at plug and play. Uh, at this time, there was, no, there was no product. It was just a PowerPoint. And um, I didn't get in. They kicked me out. They said no. <laughs> I went back dejected. But uh, they called me two weeks later and they said, you know what? Come back. Give it another try. <laughs> Thank you. And so it was the second, the second time was the charm. And uh, so, then I, uh, so then I got it. Then you, you start showing your idea to, to industry, right? So it was nice. They introduced me to a lot of companies, but nobody bought into it. Nobody would bite. But uh, you stick with it. It's very hard. And then I went to, uh, the next step was I really wanted to go to an angels group. Uh, so there's a lot of them around. Uh, there's the one in, the, in our neighborhood is uh, the Sacramento Angels. Uh, I, the, the first one I pitched at is called the Bay Angels, Bay Area Angels. A very cool guy named Jordan Wabe runs it. And uh, Jordan, Jordan just beat me up. He, when I first applied, he, he, he said, are you kidding? He goes, what is wrong with you? <laughs> he goes, your pitch is so bad. I mean, it was just a lot of painful lessons to get. I must have gone through three or four really, really painful sessions with Jordan before he would finally let me pitch to his group. And that, and that really helps you because you're, you're learning along the way. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the pitch that if you want, if you watch my pitch at Demo Day and you were to compare it to what I did at Plug and Play, I mean, it's just completely, you, you wouldn't recognize the company. So it's, other than the name of the company, it's totally different, right? So that, that's, that's my journey. I mean, the other thing that, that, I, that I'm doing along the way is I'm attracting team members, right? So, so the most important thing I did was I attracted a development team, which I was very fortunate to know from my previous efforts. And so that, that kind of was a, easy for me, but I think for many startups, very hard. Uh, I, would, I would recommend you do not find a development team offshore, I think that is, especially for your technology. I think you need to find somebody who is right near at hand that you can, you can sit down and have lunch with. And then, uh, and, but maybe, maybe you're the technology guy, and then you need to find the commercial guy that's like going to go out and, and, and raise the business. My business plan called for three leaders. I wanted someone to run the commercial team, someone to run the development team, and someone to handle the investors. A startup is really two businesses in one. I, I think it's important because people are interested in the journey, right? But I, I can tell you the way I set up my business was, and this was based on my, my experience from before, I set up like a three-legged stool, right? So you, you have the technology team, run by my guy, Oscar, who, who I was lucky to have those guys around. Sasha Pyer runs the commercial team, and, and he's, he's a great guy, but I met him uh, on my journey, you know, uh, right after that plug and play pitch, and I met Sasha and, he, and brought him into the company, and I, and I was able to attract him by, by, sh- by making him a co-founder and sharing a big chunk of equity and teaching him the vision. And then the last, and certainly not least, is the person who, who handles my investor relations. And so that, the title is CFO. Uh, her name is Annika Sorensen, and she's an awesome, awesome woman in business. And uh, I was very lucky to get her. But her job, even though her title is CFO, and she does that job as well, but the other hat, the more important hat, is she handles all of our investor relations. So, I mean, we both do it. She and I both do it. We'll go out and we'll pitch to investors. We'll talk to angels and stuff. Um, but once they get interested and they, and they become an investor, then that's her job to make sure they're happy, they're informed. Um, and, and they're there for the, for the long haul all the way to that price round. So you think about the company in that way, and it's, and it's, it's critical because you have your technology product, but then build on top of that technology product, there's really two businesses. You're, you're running a commercial business, which is going to grow over time, but in a startup, generally, you're not profitable. There's no way to live on the income 
from, you know, we charge a dollar a delivery at the most, right? It's a, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be a long time before I'm able to pay my developer salaries based on that. So it's just kind of like this disruptive pricing. But so then you have to have that other business running, which is the investor relations to ensure that you have capital to succeed. So that's the journey. So now you've, att you've attracted your team. You, you've, you've got a, a good idea. You're starting to build what we call the minimum viable product, something that you can demo, something you could show. Maybe it's just a, a, a fake view right now that somebody helped you build. And then, and then you, get, you start to get buy-in and now you start to get customers and then you get that first customer that's your pilot customer and now you're really going. And now you're ready to do, you're ready for an accelerator. So that, that would be somebody like Newark Venture Partners who takes a look at you and says, okay, these guys have got something going. We can help them. Not everybody needs an accelerator. Uh, we, we, I was kind of unsure, but I really liked the program and I, I, I think they did a great job. But an accelerator is going to brush you up, right? They're going to brush you up. They're going to they're gonna teach you how to pitch better. They're going to they're gonna give you a, um, they're, they're going to help your marketing team. They're going to help train your salespeople to do a better job on that. They're going to tighten up your product and they're going to, most importantly, introduce you to, into an ecosystem of investors because there is no way I could find a series A or a price round investor on my own. It's just too hard, right? But once I joined NVP, the tables turned. Instead of me emailing and knocking on doors, the investors started coming to me. And, and now I'm talking to investors two or three times a week because they're coming to me. And that's the power of the accelerator. It sounds like through the whole process, you have to have a lot of humility and uh, be open to criticism so that you can really improve what you're doing. You can't be married to what you start with because that's not going to get you very far. You've got to be willing to listen to others. And listen to the market. You know, um, we, we, we call it a pivot, right? So, so often you climb up one hill and you can see what you see in the valley is not what you expected. So when we, when we started, the reason I named the company Sensor Transport is I thought that 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 one feature, that IoT connecting feature, would be the end all and be all of, of what we do. But it's not. Uh, what we've found is that the digitized delivery, even without the sensor, is really the product. And, and our, uh, if I could, I'd rename the company, actually, because it's created confusion. Um, but we, we are in the digitized delivery business, and the sensor is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a really cool feature that some of our customers use. So, so that is a lesson that we learned along the way, and uh, that's, you know, that's what happens. You make mistakes, and you, you learn. Um, in the startup chase, uh, you have to learn quickly because otherwise you run out of money. <laughs> You're getting some attention in the Sacramento Business Journal. Uh, I was lucky enough to live in Elk Grove where they have a very innovative program where they're trying to attract startups. I'm an Elk Grove native, so I was, I'm the first. I'm the first uh, startup that's part of this Elk Grove Accelerator program. So it's very nice. They give you, it's actually a non-equity grant. So just to understand what that means, every time an investor signs up, what they do is they're, they're signing up on, they're, they're basically giving you money, loaning you money in exchange for future equity. Um, so they, they will own a part of the company in the future. But of course, Elk Grove is a non-equity grant, so they don't. So it's almost like, okay, let's do it, right? So it's, it's nice because you worry about dilution. And uh, as a, if you're in startups, you should worry about dilution. It's, it's very, it happens where, 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 and I've met founders where this has happened, where they, they put a lot of love into a, into a, into a great company that, that grows, but because they weren't careful about how much equity they were they were giving out, they, their, their stock got diluted to the point where they really could have made the same amount of money just working for, for somebody else during, that, during those five years. Not that making money is the most important thing. You're also trying to disrupt a market, but still, you, you should get good, you should get good uh, return. So that leads me to your question, which is the Sacramento Business Journal. Very cool because um, of Elk Grove's cool program. Uh, there was a little blurb in the newspaper which got Sacramento Business Journal noticed us and they're like, hey, let's talk, let's, what, what are these guys doing? So I had a very nice interview uh, yesterday and, and hopefully we'll be in a forthcoming issue. Uh, it's, it's also something that you do as a startup. You're almost trying to get your name out there. There's kind of like, there's almost like a checklist, right? Of things you need to do to get to that, to get investors, right? So one of them is definitely promotion. Uh, so, you know, you promote yourself on social media and any mentions, free media that you can get in industry journals or, and it's all good. It's all good because you want to get your name out there. You want to be known. And that way you can seem bigger than you are. One of our core cultural 
things, <laughs> we call it shine your shoes, is we try to keep everything that's customer facing or external facing as tight and as clean and as nice as possible because it makes us look bigger than we are. And, and that's, a, that's an important thing. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Something you're quite good at, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for telling us more about sensor transport, Rob. Yeah, it's fun. I love talking about sensor transport <laughs> anytime. <laughs> it's my favorite topic. Listeners can learn more about sensor transport by visiting sensortransport.com and they can like sensor transport's page on Facebook. Do you have any other social media channels you want to promote? LinkedIn? Connect with me on LinkedIn if you're interested. I, and I and I don't mind uh, helping out uh, anybody that want that has questions about um, you know their startup or, or or what it's like to do a startup. I would highly recommend uh, Gust Gust uh, G U S T. It's a, it's a it's where you can establish your equity and establish your company as a Delaware corporation, and they also give you a lot of advice. Um, and, that, and so I did that when I founded the company and, uh, and you get, get control of things that way. But yeah, uh, there's a, it's, it's an interesting journey. I think there's a lot of good books out there on it. And uh, certainly every experience would be unique. So any, any founder you talk to will have a different story and a different journey, but um, I'm happy to share. Thank you to all of our listeners. I'm Kristen Berkery, and you can learn more about Biz in the 916 by visiting bizinthe916.com. You can support Biz in the 916 by becoming a sponsoring subscriber on Patreon, and soon we'll be launching exclusive useful business content for Patreon supporters. So don't miss out on even more from Biz in the 916. I invite you to join us in the lounge for the next Biz in the 916. Stay tuned for future episodes, where I'll be talking to more local entrepreneurs who have learned how to make the most of their small businesses. They'll share their wisdom and help you shorten your learning curve so you can make your business more successful. 